warehoused in Ohio's institutions for the mentally retarded? There must be, because they are. Spend the next few minutes with us seeing things as they really are for hundreds and hundreds of our children, children of all ages who are locked into this never-changing world, an empty world where nothing ever happens. It's a simple story in many ways because it is a story of what does not take place. And the best way to illustrate this story is with the starkness of the institutions that we have. Take the one in North Central Ohio where more than 300 people live in a building that was once a maximum security ward for the insane. It now has a new name. It's a cottage. Sure it is. With cells. As depressing as these scenes are, there are many things that have happened that are not on film. Things that are locked in the minds of people who have seen them. It's, the living conditions are, they aren't fit for human beings. I have a daughter, she's nine years old. She's severely retarded, she's hyperactive, and she's hard to handle at home. But she's content, she's a happy, lovable little girl. And to think that one day she'll have to enter a state institution is unbearable because I know the conditions, I know the world she would go to. She cannot dress herself, so she wouldn't have clothing. She would be naked. She's hyperactive, so from necessity she would be tied to a bench. This is where she'd spend her entire day. And when I said that this is a story of what does not happen, here's what I mean. The retarded children and adults who pose too great a problem for the limited staff become victims of a simple solution. Instead of psychiatric help, they get isolation. Some are kept naked, caged, where they won't do any damage to anything or anyone. And the truth is, of course, that they won't do anything at all, except get worse, and whatever potential they might have for improvement goes down the drain. Some patients who are difficult cases are simply locked in their cells. Their food is thrust inside. Some are hosed down to clean them. And that's it. Day in and day out, that's it. No one pretends that our state institutions are anything to be proud of, but how bad is bad? Does the state of Ohio have to draw a line and say that these handicapped people have no right to a real share of life? What kind of existence is it? And that existence does not include the right to leave the building, for example, where a typical resident spends day after day in an oppressive day room, night after night in a cell, or a crowded dormitory ward where the stench of human waste is unpleasant in the winter and unbelievable in the summer. Even patients who could take on responsibilities at the institution are restricted like this. Their lives are empty. They have been empty. They will be empty unless the state does something to open up their opportunities. The greatest tragedies in our story center around at least two identifiable groups of people living in these state institutions. The first, of course, are the young, who come into the system from the relative protection of their homes or from private institutions that have cared for them until they reach the age of six, which is the minimum age for admission to a state facility. They come into a situation that offers no future. Whatever training the parents have been able to accomplish quickly is forgotten. The children enter a life where there is no stimulation for them to achieve any mental growth. If they had control of their toilet functions, they lose this. If they had verbal abilities, they stand to lose these too. They may spend much of their time fighting for survival against older and stronger and uncontrolled children. And where are the attendants? They're changing diapers, trying to maintain some form of control. And where are the teachers, the psychologists, the professionals? What professionals? What teachers or psychologists? Some of the people fighting so hard to make conditions better are people whose own lives have been torn up by having to send their children into Ohio institutions. When he went, he was taught, nearly toilet trained, and I was promised that he would be kept in training pants and that some training would be continued. I was shown around the, the grounds and I saw the nice places. I assumed that this is where he would fit in. And after he was diagnosed and gone through all the um, uh, make a wrong thing, <coughs> uh, go through, he was assigned to his permanent cottage. And uh, when my husband and I demanded to see where he was, and I mean demanded because you are not shown specifically where your child will be, uh, he was in conditions that I couldn't believe he would possibly have been able to survive in. 
people back to you all set in pills. He had constant diarrhea. We asked if we could bring him home to uh, get him in a better condition so that he could, could at least um, survive. Um, when I saw this ward, I went completely to pieces. I told my husband we had to take him with us. We couldn't leave him there. And he helped me out of the ward. And he said, think about it. What are you going to do with him? You have another choice. And what about the older retarded who come into the state institutions at a time in their lives when they have been living secure in their homes, who come in at a time when these homes can no longer take care of them? They do have abilities that may have been very successfully developed in a workshop or a school in their own communities. And so many of them arrive in our state facilities to start an empty life that does not allow them to utilize any of that training. And day after day passes, and as we said, the story is, what does not happen. Now don't be misled, because there are hundreds and hundreds of people in our state institutions who have been there for years, who developed sometime back to the limit of their abilities, and they stopped. And they stayed there year after year, offered no chance at all to have an outlet for their energies, and soon reaching a point where there are no energies at all. What we propose is that this must not go on. What we propose is the theory that the retarded can achieve a certain amount of independence and self-reliance, no matter how profoundly they may be afflicted. That even those with virtually no measurable intellectual capacity can still understand and appreciate some diversion in their lives. What we propose is not to cast the blame on the people who do run these institutions, but to show how many more people are needed. Because as we stated, our story is what is not happening the low salary levels, and of course the grim working conditions that exist have made it difficult for the administrators to staff their hospitals with the right people. But there's a nucleus of dedicated professionals who deserve help now, so that the light that they've been waiting for at the end of the road will shine in and brighten the lives of everyone at the institutions. And you should remember especially that just about all of us at some time will have some involvement with these warehouses for the retarded. It could be your child, or your grandchild, or someone else in your family, or a neighbor's child, or maybe in the family of someone you work with. But you can be sure that there will be involvement. The statistics are too sure, too predictable. It will take money, of course, money and patience. But it is a crisis that will pass in time if the right solutions are applied. Take these scenes home with you now and see where they lead you in helping us find those solutions. Solutions that are within reach of this great wealthy state in which we live.